takes at least four years to build a medical school application, and it also takes just four seconds for an admissions committee member to send you a rejection letter. And 30,000 pre-meds every single year get nothing but rejection emails. And when I was pre-med, that was my very worst fear. So I wanted to know why most pre-meds were rejected. I scoured forum after forum on Student Doctor Network, Reddit, and watched hundreds of hours of interviews of admissions committee members. And after hearing from so many different ad comms, here are the eight things that I've seen get pre-meds rejected every single year. Remember, your medical school application is a story. It starts with your name, your demographics, your disadvantage status, your GPA, your MCAT, goes down the line asking about your working activities, your resume, your CV, and then asks you to close everything out with a personal statement explaining why you want to become a doctor. And so today we'll take apart those very same pieces and show you key mistakes people make on different sections of the application. And the first red flag at the top of the application is having an institutional action without ownership or maturity or growth after the event. Here are two examples of institutional actions, one for alcohol and freshman year and another for academic dishonesty. Both of them got into fantastic medical schools, one at UCSF and another at a fantastic state school. And that is because of how they approached the situation. Let me show you. I erroneously assumed that I was not violating academic conduct code. I realized that ignorance is not an excuse. I take full responsibility for my actions. I have since reviewed the student conduct code and university standards of conduct, met with my school associate dean to discuss the violations and consequences, and completed an academic integrity workshop. Though I deeply regret this lapse in judgment, I do not regret the lessons of maturity, respect, and responsibility the experience has taught me. You can see that this person has made no excuses. Honestly, uploading a study guide to Course Hero is a mistake that probably hundreds, if not thousands of pre-meds make every single year. And a very common first reaction is to be angry at Course Hero, angry at some silly rules because it's not truly cheating. This pre-med does none of that, gets straight to the point where he owns his mistake and takes full responsibility of all the lessons it taught him. That's maturity and that's growth. Here is example number two. I was found responsible for underage drinking and failure to comply while living in the on-campus residential community. And again, who knows the entire context of the situation? Was he even drinking? Was he holding a beer can that someone else gave him that he didn't want? Was he just in the wrong place at the wrong time wanting to get out of that room as soon as possible, actually telling other people that they should not be drinking? Who knows the context? Still, I want you to see his response and his description of the event. I made it a priority to uphold the expectations and value of the university and to respect the authority of others. I did not have any further conduct violations and this experience contributed to me becoming a resident assistant during my third year. As an RA, I used this mistake as a means of guiding other residents who found themselves responsible for violating the conduct code. After being documented, residents often panic and start to believe that their mistakes will close off future opportunities. In these cases, I made an example of myself and shared that by learning from my mistakes, my opportunities, like being an RA, stayed open. And his opportunities, like getting into UCSF Medical School, one of the most competitive schools in the nation, also stayed open off the back of his maturity, his growth, and his willingness to be vulnerable and share his story with other people going through similar things. Every year, over 50,000 pre-meds apply to medical school and over 60% don't get into a single one. If this video hasn't been completely trashed thus far, I highly encourage you to take a look at the free resources we have in our description box below. Click the link in the description box to find out more. And for now, let's go back to the video. 
The second red flag that ad comms hate to see is a great otherwise applicant that has minimal to no clinical experiences. These applicants are pretty much missing the entire point. You are trying to become a doctor and folks that do not have the exposure in clinical experiences, whether it's in healthcare settings like the hospital or the clinic or a nursing home, those pre-meds may not know exactly what they're committing themselves to. In a world now where it feels like every pre-med has a thousand hours of being an EMT, a thousand hours of being a scribe, just knowing the culture and the terminology of healthcare and the problems that providers, patients, and the entire system face, and you can only get that through hours and hours of clinical experiences. The third red flag that adcoms hate is not having longitudinal experiences. Whether it's volunteering, research, or clinical experiences, Time under the activity matters. One, because it shows commitment to a long-term mission, a team, a project, and its goals. And two, because most awesome things, most impactful things take a lot of time to build and develop. If you want to build an impactful resume, part of that is just getting enough hours in that activity to grow, learn, and develop it. I've seen far too many volunteer experiences that happen one weekend over the last four years or research boot camps where you've worked for two weeks straight and don't really have much to say for it. The culture defining projects in medicine happen over months to years to decades certainly not days to weeks. Red flag number four, when an activity has pretty much zero actual real hours, but thousands of projected hours. There's a part on every single work and activity section where you can anticipate how many hours you will be doing over the course of the next year. It's a feature designed for you to be able to get credit for the gap year activities that you are enrolled in or planning to do. With that being said, oftentimes students struggle with writing about these activities and rightly so. They've really only put 10 to 15 hours and so it's really hard to say anything much more than I trained for this scribing position and here I am, but I expect to do 2000 hours over the next year. In this scenario, what I suggest is to make sure that you send an update letter after you've done 500, 1000 hours at an appropriate time in the cycle to actually detail your roles and responsibilities, what you've learned and what you got out of that activity. Without it, you spent one out of your 15 work and activity slots on just something generic that doesn't add. Here are two examples of activities with short real hours and a large amount of projected hours. And you can see for yourself if they feel or come across as more generic than you'd like. Red flag number five that ad comms hate to see. Submitting an application late. I have seen multiple admissions committee members share how surprised they were at the type of caliber of student they would accept earlier on in the cycle. As you start to get past September, October, November, there are fewer and fewer seats available at your medical school because you've already given a couple of acceptances. And at that time, if your application is evaluated with that group, you better be the best because the bar to get accepted becomes much higher every single month. If it's February and I really only have one acceptance left to give, I am going to hold on to it for as long as humanly possible until I see the best pre-med this world has ever seen. Do not submit your application late. It has a huge effect on your candidacy. Red flag number six, not doing your research on a school and submitting a generic why us secondary. Yes, it is true that many medical school missions sound very similar. And yes, it is true that a medical school website will not capture the entire culture and experience that you will get as a medical student on that campus. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to reach out to the medical school and find medical students, find faculty members, find people and alumni who have gone through that program to do your own research. This is a place you'll be spending $200,000, $300,000 in and four years of your life and trust with your medical training. 
Do your homework, name drop during the secondaries and the interviews because you want to demonstrate that you have done your homework and you are very interested in this program. This is why our students at Pre-Med Catalyst have a protected time dedicated to just outreaching to their dream medical schools. It's important to build a relationship and even if you do not, it is important to demonstrate that you have done the hard work proactive, intentional work about learning about the program. Red flag number seven is just having a bad letter of recommendation. Yes, it's true that not every letter writer of yours will know you like your best friend does. However, bad letters of recommendations can really sink even the most stellar applicants. Make sure that you're not rubbing people the wrong way and make sure that you're choosing your letter writers, your advocates for your admission to medical school very carefully. Red flag number eight, and personally probably one of the most painful ones, is just having really bad interview answers. Why do you want to become a doctor and why do you want to come to this medical school are probably the two most obvious questions you will get on every single interview day. You must be prepared to come across the way that you want to. I've seen pre-meds really flaunt and demonstrate their immaturity by saying that my parents are doctors, that's all I've ever known and I've never really considered anything else. Or I was born and destined to become a surgeon. I totally get it and empathize with it. I was a pre-med as well and I was very concerned with making sure I say the right thing. And so sometimes you can get it backwards and twisted and convoluted in your head that what you believe medical schools will want to hear is actually some fake facade mask that you put on to just hopefully impress them. And that has never been true and never will be true. The genuine, earnest, mature pre-med inside of you has to come out if you want any chance of becoming a doctor. And if you feel yourself that you do not have the character traits, the maturity, the humility to become a doctor, that's totally okay. I myself didn't have it one time in my life. I still may not have it, but I think the importance is recognizing it and trying to develop those character traits. So when you come across an interviewer, you can demonstrate your authentic, ready to be a medical student self. And so today we talked about eight red flags that I've gathered after scouring the internet far and wide for what admissions committees hate to see. In a medical school admissions context where it is so competitive nowadays, we cannot have any red flag throw our entire application out the window. That leaves an interesting follow-up question though. Why is medical school admissions so competitive? And why do I believe that that's actually a good thing? That video where I discuss that topic is one of our most popular videos and it is here for you to watch now, why medical school should be competitive. Thank you for your time. Hopefully this was helpful for you and I will see you in the next one.